It is Sunday, and of course, that means showtime. Episode number nine of Talking Ball with Bex. When we started this journey about two odd months ago, we had one goal in mind, my friends, and that was to help kids get recruited south of the border. It is working. I'll tell you what. Since that time, we have had four Olympic athletes on the program, former MLB stars, World Series champions, a ton of future stars of the week from our platform, Next from the North, which I said is working. We are getting kids recruited. Each and every day, coaches from all over America are reaching out wanting to meet kids from Next from the North. So it is working, as I said. Why is it working? Because you have subscribed to the show. Every single subscription gets us bigger and better guests. And man, oh man. Do we have one today, my friends? We're talking about Major League All-Star, one of the finest young arms in the Major Leagues. Atlanta Braves pitcher from the YYC, Michael Soroka, is standing by to talk a little ball with Bex. We've also got another future star of the week from Vancouver Island, the Victoria Mariners program. Uh, Catcher Sinclair Lee is ready to uh, have a little chat with us as well. As always, I'm going to ask you to subscribe if you haven't done so already because every subscription helps. It helps us get bigger, better guests, which in turn puts more eyes on our program and next from the north. So in the bottom right corner, you see a red button and it is subscribe. All you have to do is hit that, click it. If it asks you to sign in, you just use your Google password. It's not a membership. It's not a spam. It is simply a free way to help more kids at Next from the North. So do it now. Subscribe to the channel. Then throw your feet up and relax. And let us entertain you for the next hour and a bit with, again, Major League All-Star Atlanta Braves superstar pitcher Mike Soroka standing by. We're going to get to it right away this week, my friends. Don't want to waste any time. So right after this, Sinclair Lee. Future star of the week from the Victoria Mariners. Thanks a lot for stopping by. You're talking ball with Bex from Gap to Gap and Coast to Coast. Episode 9 coming at you right now. from gap to gap and coast to coast as always our first guest of the week is our future star spotlight of next from the north and this week we're going west we always seem to miss the west because we're focused on alberta it's where we are it's where we're from there's so many good players out west and this week we are taking care of it with one great young catcher. He currently plays for the Victoria Mariners, uh, graduating 2023 and uh, on his way down south for sure to a great program. And again, he plays the position that nobody seems to want to play. He does it well, and he is with us as our future star of the week. We welcome from Victoria, British Columbia, Sinclair Lee. Thanks a lot for coming by, buddy. Yeah. How's everything over there on the island? It's going good. Yeah, playing lots of baseball right now, so that's good. And that's awesome because, yeah. uh, as we know, much of the country is not playing lots of baseball. So let's talk about that a little bit, Sinclair. There's uh, There's been a lot of uh, downtime this past year, more so in other provinces than, than you guys. But how's it been different for you, uh, for you over in Victoria? Um, it's not bad over here. It stayed pretty consistent. Um, through the winter, it was indoors mostly. We have pretty bad weather over here. But past couple of months, we've gotten outside. But... It's overall been pretty good. Yeah, it's been uh, different in BC than uh, lots of the other provinces for sure. You guys have done a great job, and so for for the most part, you're saying practices remain pretty constant through the uh, through the COVID year. Um, about like in the summer, it kind of started back up, and then yeah, probably about three practices a week. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, and, uh, are you able to play any games this year? Do you think? Uh, probably not. Maybe in June, but that's about it, if that. 
Right, right, for sure. Um, so you've been with the Mariners for quite a while now, Sinclair. Is that uh, where you've played most of your youth baseball? Um, no, actually, I, this is my third year with the Victoria Mariners. I grew up playing okay. Gordon Head baseball, and then I switched to Beacon Head Little League. Oh yeah, for, for sure. And so travel ball has been sort of the last three years. And how yeah. much are you liking the how much are you liking the the difference of travel over Little League? I love it. I don't know. Not as much to say. <laughs> it's good times. It's fun to get out with your buddies and hit the road, isn't it? For sure, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's a different different thing. Gives you kind of a taste of what college baseball is going to end up being for you, and uh, sort of not being in the one ballpark playing against the same kids all the time. You're out moving around and traveling. Have you been able to do some traveling with the team, Sinclair? Have you have you played in some tournaments outside of Victoria? Not too much. Just a couple of years ago, we just normal season went to Vancouver every weekend, stuff like that. Awesome. How about the States? Have you been down there at all for any tournaments? I have. I've been to Vegas twice for two tournaments. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, how did you guys match up against the Americans? It's always such an eye-opening experience playing against American kids for the first time. It is. It sure is. Um, we actually won the second year. We won the whole thing. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. That's yeah. That's awesome. So you like to catch Sinclair. It's I do. It's always interesting to me um, to find out when that started and how you kind of chose to go behind the plate because it's a really difficult position. Uh, lots of things going on from, from organizing the pitches to uh, the defense to uh, blocking baseballs, throwing runners out. Talk about catching and what drew you behind the plate. Um, it kind of all started at a young age. You know, I just started catching. I just kind of, it was my best position and I've just kind of stuck with it ever since. Yeah, what what is it that you like about the position, Sinclair? Um, I really like receiving balls. I don't know why, but I just like receiving balls, yeah. Yeah, you like framing them up and framing, yep. helping your pitchers out? Yeah, it's always sweet to throw That's at a runner at second as well. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. How's your pop time? Is it pretty pretty good so pretty far? Pretty good, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. And what about uh, reading reading opposing batters? Do you get into sort of figuring out where guys are weak and where you want to throw pitches? Have you gotten that deep into uh, the analytics of it yet? Um, a little bit. You kind of like look at how they run pregame, see if they hit like power hitter or if they're more of a contact hitter, and then you pitch around that. Mm-hmm. And uh, how about your team this year? Are you excited about the prospects of the Mariners? Yeah, we've got a solid team. You know, we've got, like, solid infield, solid outfield. So, yeah, it's a really good team. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. What about uh, the pitching staff? you got a pretty good core group of arms coming up? It's pretty good, yeah. We've got a couple of good pitchers. A couple guys thrown in the 80s now, so that's good. Oh, geez, there you go. Yeah. There you go. That's pretty good because you are 15U I right am. Now, uh, Okay. 16 you. 16 yes. you. Awesome. So sophomore in high school. Yes. And uh, as you're starting to kind of analyze your chances, what what are you thinking about for uh, for college? Are you thinking that, you know, you're going to be able to play at the next level, Sinclair? Is that something that's on the horizon for you? Yeah, I think it is for sure. I'm really, you know, putting in the work for it. So hopefully it pays out. For sure. And uh, are you starting to kind of reach out to any schools and get that uh, that initial contact going with any? Uh, yeah, I've had a phone call with one school down in the States, and I'm planning a call with another one soon. That's awesome, buddy. You, you certainly need to, to get that motion going, right? Get, get as many calls out there as you can because, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult time uh, in the college baseball world in that lots and lots of guys – stuck around when they would have moved on by now and so scholarships have dropped a little bit as far as covid goes because everybody got an extra year of eligibility so the more schools you can reach out to and the more coaches you can start to get on their radar uh, is, is very very important um, what about uh, area of us have you thought about where you'd like to go and where you'd like to play is something always kind of triggered your interest you said you've been to vegas a couple times but uh, is there somewhere else in the country that uh, excites you about going down um if i had a choice i'd probably like to stay on the west side of the states yeah uh, it's, like, i like the, the like warm the ocean? weather ocean's very nice yeah 
Yeah, it's tough. When you grow up in a place like Victoria, um, you know, you get pretty used to the ocean. I, I grew up on the west coast in Vancouver, and now I live in Alberta, and I miss the water an awful lot. So, <laughs> yeah. How about schoolwork? Are you, uh, are you hitting the books hard? Are you doing a good job in, uh, in the classroom as well? I am, yes. Yes. Yeah, Studying that's hard. Awesome. I see... I see that uh, you have an interest in, in chasing down a law degree, maybe. I do. How do your parents feel about that? They're fine with it. They don't really have much say, but they, they're fine with it. They like it. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Do they know how much law school costs? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. It's, uh, it's a long journey, but, man, it's rewarding in the end for sure. I, I hope you get the chance to chase down that dream <clears throat> as well. Thank you. What about some of your goals for this year? What are you trying to improve on, Sinclair? What are your, uh, your, your points of interest as far as getting better at the game, from catching, from hitting, uh, all of them? Just sort of touch on the things you really need to work on this year. Um, I, do, I do feel like I have to work on my blocking a little bit. It's still coming along, but I feel like it's still pretty solid, but still got to work on that. Um, I do want to get my exit velo up and work on my uh, throwing velocity as well. Okay. Yeah, what kinds of things are you doing to, to achieve that? What are your drills, that your go-to drills for those types of uh, parts of the game? I do lots of band works, um, strengthening my arm, um, hitting the gym a lot, getting stronger, and lots of like posture work, hip work to get my swing faster. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's such an involved position. Like I said, there's many different aspects you have to continue to work on, you know, to be that next level catcher. One thing that plays to your advantage, though, is it's not a huge position of uh, interest at the youth level. So your competition for scholarships is certainly lower than, say, a shortstop or a starting pitcher, uh, you know, or a center fielder for that matter, where you know, as the catcher, you, you certainly have a leg up on some of the competition out there for sure. Let's talk about some of the people that have influenced your young career, Sinclair. Who, uh, who are the go-tos from a coaching perspective and on the personal side too? Who's, who's helped you set the path of your baseball career? My parents, my dad has helped me set the path a lot. Uh, my coaches have helped me a lot. They've kind of moved along like the, uh, kind of process of looking for more schools right and is there is there one coach in particular that's kind of helped you with your game the most over the years um probably mike chupoy he's uh my uh coach at school as well and he's the coach of the older team in the victoria manor so i really like working with him okay and he, he spends time with you individually as well as in the team setting he does yes yeah awesome yeah. it's uh one thing again about being a catcher you end up kind of off to the side doing different work from the rest of the team right it's uh it's such a unique position in that way what about uh some bigger goals sinclair are you uh are you thinking t12 are you thinking national junior national team that sort of stuff is that all things that drive you forward yeah i mean it would be awesome to play on the junior national team you know that's my next goal right so just gotta keep working hard to get there yeah, there's no question. It's yeah. all about the hard work. And what about T12? Do you guys have a T12 tryout situation down there? No, we don't. No, even no. to go over to Vancouver and perhaps give it a shot over there. I could, yeah, but we don't really, we don't really talk about that much over here. So is that right, Hayden? Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's a pretty unique opportunity. I mean, T12 is the best of the best in our country for sure. They gather in Rogers Center, so that's super exciting to be able to tee it up with uh, in the place where the Jays play and and certainly it's a it's a pretty amazing tournament so something to definitely think about going forward let's talk about social life Sinclair is one of the things about baseball players um, year-round academy type players is you get locked in you're, you're six days a week you're 11 months a year you're your baseball 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 how do you balance and make sure you remember to be a kid once in a while too. Um, I don't know. You just kind of work around your baseball schedules, hang out with your friends. Make sure, obviously, make sure you finish your homework first. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, it's important, man. You gotta you gotta balance. It's you can't just do baseball. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of that, are you are you a multi sport athlete, Sinclair? Is there something else you like to play besides baseball? Um, yes, I play soccer as well on a club. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <clears throat> See, again, that's the kind of thing that it, it builds your athleticism. It, uh, it it makes you better in so many different ways, and and it makes it makes it that you don't get stagnant, so that you're just baseball all the time and locked in lots and lots of kids out there they uh they get they get stuck in that rut of just baseball uh, and as they move forward and and continue on as their career gets longer and longer it starts to become a bit of a chore right and you want to make sure you you balance out everything and and life uh you got the gaming headset on what's your go-to uh video game sinclair um i like playing mlb the show i do like playing that <laughs> Awesome. Do you got the new version now? I don't. I still have 20, but it's still fun. So <laughs> They haven't made a ton of changes, right? No. I mean, my, my son is uh, is huge into it as well, and it's, uh, it's a fun game, man. They've done a pretty great job of, yeah. of doing it. You get online and play against your friends online? Sometimes, yeah. yeah Sometimes I just... That's cool, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, we're uh, we're on the precipice of another baseball season, Sinclair, and uh, I, I'm glad that you guys are are still playing. Again, the rest of the country is suffering through some uh, some more lockdown type stuff. So, um, you know, it's 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 great that you guys are able to get on the field and practice as a group and as a team. So, I wish you an unbelievable uh, 2021 and forward. And again. Uh, start contacting those schools and let's get you uh, let's get you locked up into a great program down south because you seem like a great kid and uh, for all intents and purposes you're doing it right behind the plate uh, and at the at the plate as well. So Sinclair's been awesome, man. Thanks a lot for coming on the show and uh, yeah, again, have a great 2021. Thank you very much. Awesome, buddy. Cheers. Cheers. That's a great young kid, all the way from uh, Victoria, B.C. and the Victoria Mariners program, uh, Sinclair Lee. Outstanding young catcher with a great future. I can assure you we'll see him somewhere down the line. In just a second, my friends, we step it up to the next level. Major League All-Star pitcher Michael Soroka standing by to talk at ball with Bex in just a couple of minutes. We'll be right back. Don't you dare go anywhere. You're talking ball with bags from gap to gap and coast to coast, and we have reached a very special moment in our young history as we welcome our first active member of Major League Baseball. He is the highest draft pick in Canadian baseball history, taking just a couple spots higher than friend and mentor Chris Rietzma at number 28 by the Atlanta Braves in June of 2015. Since then, all he's done is become an all-star finish second in Rookie of the Year balloting, and become the youngest opening day starter in Atlanta Braves history. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Mr. Mike Soroka to Talking Ball with Bex. Good day, sir. Thanks so much for stopping by, and how are things down in Atlanta? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Things are uh, things are good. I wish I was uh, with the team uh, leaving Dunedin going to Washington right now, but um, you know we're uh, on our way back, and uh, hopefully soon. Yeah, so so much to talk about, Mike. I, I don't want to take your entire day, so let's get right after it and start with the obvious. As Canadians all over this country will want to know, how are you doing physically? Good, good. I, I think, uh, I mean, it's a tough situation coming through spring training and uh, having the shoulder uh, kind of start to bark a little bit. Uh, I was in the first sim game, actually, outside of spring training. And, um, you know, I... I'd, let the medical staff know too that I was going to be honest with this process. If there was something that wasn't feeling right, we weren't going to push it given that it was April. And I mean, really we were doing everything we could to, to try and be with the bull. And, um, you know, I think part of it was ego getting in the way for me, not wanting to accept that, you know, I might have to take a little more time, but, um, you know, we started to dive into a lot of things, how, how things were working mechanically on the, on the bottom side with me and, uh, you know, we decided that until those things are right, then, um, you know, that'll be our, our go forward is to be able to kind of support everything up top. Right. So, um, you know, once that clicks and, and hopefully we'll be back soon. 
Yeah, I'm always interested because we tell um, youth in this country and, and all over in the game of baseball to uh, monitor soreness versus pain. So how do you, at the major league level, how do you gauge that and uh, the difference between the two that we always say to kids, don't push past pain, uh, but push past soreness? Um, yeah, I think it's it's different too because as a kid, usually you're going to end up pitching, say you pitch on a Thursday or Friday and you'll go play first or third the rest of the weekend, at least that's what I did, or, you know, some kids, better athletes, they'll play shortstop in center field. But, um, you know, obviously you're going to be sore the days after you throw a lot. Uh, so that's kind of to be expected. But uh, with us on a five-day rotation, you should never really not feel good on your fifth day. And there's going to be little things here and there, obviously, you know, hips, back, knees, sometimes um, some things tend to bark, but you know, you know what, you're able to kind of get warm, play through, get some treatment on, um, you know, with your arm, it, it's such a, it, you know, it's such a tough beast really, because there's little things here and there where you might feel something one pitch or you might let them go and it might feel a little weird and then it's gone the next one. But uh, to me, when something doesn't feel right and you get that feeling, you get the kind of pit in your stomach uh, where, you know, it's, it's not right. And uh, you know, that's when it's time to say something. So, uh, that's what happened this time is, is what, you know, the only reason I knew is because I dealt with a similar injury in the past and I knew exactly how to find it and how to kind of test it. Um, so knowing that uh, I was kind of an no-brainer just to shut it down. But, um, you know, it, it is tough, especially when you've never dealt with it. Um, you know, prior to 2018, I, I had never dealt with any sort of arm injury. And um, I pushed that one to the point where it, it really grabbed and I ended up with a, uh, you know, a bigger, much bigger strain than, than I do now. So, um, you know, it's all little things, but, uh, yeah, I'd say to kids, you know, expect soreness after you throw, but, uh, when you're on the mound, it, it should never hurt, never hurt to throw. Yeah. Hopes and prayers from, uh, from all of us up here, Mike, that it's uh, just temporary. And, uh, again, the Achilles put you out for a very long time. Let's hope this one is a very short time and you're able to get back on the bump very, very soon. Uh, of course, all Canadians have a vested interest in uh, what you're doing down there, but none more so than inside the Alberta borders, and more specifically, uh, the YYC. Uh, from Bishop Carroll to the major leagues, talk about youth ball in Calgary, Mike, and sort of the early days of your career and some of the influences that were a big part of setting the course for your future. Yeah, at, I mean, number one, um, it was Jim Lawson and PBF. Um, He's really what set things up for me with baseball and, you know, set the relationship up with Reitzma and um, set the relationship up with the game so that I, that I really got to grow and love uh, like it should be. Um, you know, obviously kind of when I was coming through high school is when baseball in Calgary really started to change because when I first joined PBF and the Redbirds was um, really was that or Okotoks was your only options if you wanted to play uh uh, academy in Calgary or around Calgary. Uh, other than that, you can, I think there was a couple closer to Edmonton. Um, obviously, Vauxhall's uh, uh, right there and, and Oyen a little closer out to Saskatchewan. But, um, you know, in Calgary, it was really those two clubs if you didn't, you wanted to kind of move on from uh, from Calgary baseball. Just, it, it was much easier choice. And um, like I said, uh, Jim let us love the game, let us kind of I don't want to say goof off in practice, but let us have our fun. Uh, things like taking ground balls and, and stuff like that, that you'd think would be so routine in practice. And, you know, when, when you're hammering fundamentals over and over and over again, it kind of loses, loses the love for it. And you watch Nolan Arenado make a play and why not try it, you know, and that's what Jim let us do. And um, that's kind of what set up my love for the game. That's awesome. I'm super curious as uh, someone who lives in the Okotoks area and has great involvement with the Dogs Academy, how in the world did you avoid uh, coming down to Okotoks and how did they not swallow you up as they were doing with most great young players during the mid 2000s? Yeah, I mean, again, like I said, I, I, I really connected with Jim and I really connected with Chris. And um, by the time it was time to start being recruited I was already on the junior national team so it was kind of just like you know I'm going to be with the coaches that have got me here and, and are going to get me to the next level and, uh, you know I wasn't really playing much with 
that team anymore. I wasn't really playing much in Calgary. Um, you know, most of my games were getting ready for uh, a junior national team. So, um, you know, there just wasn't a need to, to join a, a, another program. Uh, baseball with Jim was, like I said, too fun for me to, to ever think about going anywhere else. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. I, I'm sure the guys uh, here down here in Okotoks were disappointed for that you weren't uh, coming down to play because I know they were trying to, again, swallow up almost all the talent in this province at that time. Uh, I want to go back just a touch further, Mike. Um, I learned today that you were actually a hockey goalie uh, prior to uh, setting into the full-time baseball career. Uh, interesting combination. Usually goalies end up catchers, but uh, goalie to pitcher and your, your frame certainly doesn't suggest uh, big time uh, goalie. <laughs> uh, I mean, the only reason I was ever a goalie was because of Mika Kippersaw. Um, I mean, he was the reason there was hundreds of kids in Calgary that wanted to be a goalie uh, in 2004. Uh, it was everything. I mean, he was he was it for the Flames. And uh, I mean, I remember them having to cut kids from community hockey goalie because uh, there was there was too many too many kids and. Um, you know, I, I still say if, if he hadn't have been my idol, I probably would have kept playing hockey because I would have ended up, uh, out left winger defenseman like my dad. And, um, I still loved hockey on that side of things. You know, I was always begging to, to have a game to play out. Um, you know, I wanted to switch, switch positions in practice every once in a while. I wanted to, uh, you know, I was always on the driveway shooting puck or in the basement and, um, you know, I, I, th I really think being a goalie was probably the reason that steered me towards baseball. So I guess I have Kipper Soft to thank for that. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, interesting. That I'm sure you share that love for hockey with all Canadian kids growing up. At what point, Mike, did you realize it was time to shut her down and become sports specific? We hear so often about the importance of multi-sport athleticism as you're growing up. Um, when did you realize it was time to uh, focus on ball and uh, eliminate the other sports and go sports specific baseball? Yeah, I think I'm a big advocate of that, uh, being a multi-sport athlete. Uh, at a certain point, um, you know, it gets to where you're in high school and it is kind of tough, especially if you're not overly talented like some other kids. You know, some other kids can get away with only having, you know, half a year of practice in each in each sport and they're going to be able to make up for lost time because they're just that much better whether they're more physically mature uh, or they're just that much more athletic you know but you know for me it was i stopped loving hockey uh as a goalie really i just didn't love going to practice uh i always wanted to go to the cages i always wanted to hit i always wanted to pitch um i was never not looking forward to going to baseball um there was a few times though with hockey where it was kind of starting to be a bit of a drag and uh, when I kind of brought that up to my dad he wasn't very surprised so um, he was he was more than happy to see me go with baseball and um, again though that doesn't change you know what we're able to do I think again with Jim we had Sundays during the academy where we'd play another sport you know we'd get the guys together and play soccer football uh, basketball whatever it was over at uh, Strive in the Northeast and um, that never left and we're actually starting to see it more pay off down the line in the big leagues. And you look at a lot of guys that have been doing it their whole life. You know, I see some, uh, some of the, especially some of the Latin pitchers, you know, they have some crazy uh, range of motion on their backside into external rotation. And, um, you know, their, their shoulders are hypermobile and their bodies are basically, they have so much asymmetry in their body that they're built for baseball, but nothing else. And that's kind of, you know, it's kind of a dangerous situation. So, um, you know, there's so many things and you're starting to see again, the best players in baseball could have played anything they wanted, could have put Mike Trout anywhere. Same with Ronald. I don't think people quite understand the athleticism it, it takes to be somebody like Ronald Acuna. Yeah, it's interesting that you uh, you mentioned that. It's, it's, it's always amazed me that the ability of baseball players to play other sports in comparison to other professional athletes trying to take on the cage and uh, and hit a 90-mile-an-hour fastball. I don't think there's any comparison because uh, clearly the baseball players end up being able to do 
the other sports much better than vice versa. Uh, you mentioned your dad, um, obviously a huge uh, factor in your life, uh, certainly in the young years. Uh, for those who don't know, he played university and junior hockey, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm sure he was uh, hugely disappointed when you decided to, to give up the hockey, as you mentioned. Uh, funny, also, you mentioned going to the cage, Mike. I was curious, one thing about going sports-specific, but going pitching-specific. So at what point did you realize you didn't want to swing the bat anymore uh, and it was going to be the bump always? No, I I never didn't want to swing the bat. I still, uh, you know, honestly, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't probably most excited to get back into the cage and, um, you know, have a chance. I mean, probably only going to have this year is a chance to hit a home run in the big leagues. And, um, you know, I, I still think hitting batting practice is one of the most fun things you can do uh, in sports period. Uh, I got to sit there. I'd take BP all day. Um, it was just a matter of, you know, my competitiveness and, and desire to kind of be in control took over best on the mound. And I think I always knew that I'd be a pitcher. Um, but I still loved, you know, getting to the dish and, and taking some good cuts. Uh, there's nothing nothing like the feeling when you run into a good one. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I guess you were excited then a National League team took you first in the first round back when that happened, knowing that you'd still get to swing it once in a while at the very least. Um, you talked about Jim, talked about your dad. Um, I want to talk about Chris Rietzma. Obviously, uh, just a hugely important factor in your life, uh, somebody that's meant so much to your career, uh, both on and off the field. Uh, we were lucky enough to have Chris on the show, and he was just an outstanding person to speak with. Uh, just give us a few minutes and uh, talk about the relationship with Chris Reedsma. Yeah, like I said, it, it's been really, real strong for about 10 years now. Um, you know, I first went to one of his pitching clinics. I can't remember if he was still playing, or I think he was probably just about to go play in the Olympics, actually, in about 2008. So I would have been uh, nine years old or 10 years old. Um, and, you know, again, he put us up with little drills, trying to hit the baseball off the tee, little things that kind of kickstarted my love for pitching. And, um, obviously got to spend more time with him on, it was pretty well, I think every Wednesday, uh, during the off season was with the Academy with uh, PBS and I knew Chris was coming. So I knew I'd make sure I'd bring my good stuff for him. And, um, you know, those days thrown for him and, and, kind of getting a chance to grow with him was kind of the coolest part. Um, you know, I, sometimes I don't kind of clue in on, on what he would have seen from those years and uh, how he would have met me when I was just a kid. And now we're, we're more friends than anything else. And, uh, you know, I'm very lucky to have somebody like that in my life and a, a great example uh, in both sides of, of this game. Yeah, he's, uh, he was a very special person to talk to, and I grew instantly fond of uh, pretty much the person he is uh, and clearly the impact he's had on many people outside of yourself. Uh, we spoke of some of the young Olympians that he uh, became close with during that time you mentioned. And inter interestingly enough, uh, he mentioned that first, uh, that first camp where he met you in his interview as well, so clearly that had, had an impact on him. Um, as well. Uh, part of what the Ritzma uh, relationship led to probably one of the earliest uh, visits to the Team Canada portfolio of anyone in our country's history. Um, speak to the honor, uh, certainly the, uh, the trepidation that someone your age stepping into the national team scenario uh, would have had on you and just how that that played out and how the experience of playing and wearing the Team Canada jersey uh, what had an impact on you, Mike? Yeah, it, it's like nothing else. And um, to be honest with you, I, I didn't really know too much about it until I was probably about 15. Uh, and then Chris kind of let me know, like, hey, this is, you know, this is a thing. You know, this is this is where the best kids kind of go and play. And, um, you know, once we were on Team Alberta, I uh, went to the Canada Cup that year. I guess it was actually the summer games. And, uh, again, tournament 12, I was in the inaugural year, uh, and got the call from Greg Hamilton that I'd be joining the, the junior team in, uh, October on their trip to Disney. And, uh, I mean, it's a feeling that's kind of tough to really comprehend when you're that young, right? You kind of hits you. And, uh, like I said, I went from our 18 U team that year with PBS to team Alberta, uh, to team Canada. And now it all happened so fast. 
Uh, you know, I remember a bunch of guys kind of not really knowing because I, I had played with them with PBF, uh, a couple of guys that went to Vauxhall actually. And, you know, I was always just a kid, almost two years younger than some of them. And then it just jumped and all of a sudden I'm playing with them on team Canada. And, um, you know, that's kind of probably what really grounded me in this game uh, was being able to go out and play professionals when you're so physically overmatched that, you know, you really can't hold a candle to them, but you find a way to compete. Um, and that's something that I've always kind of took pride in was, you know, not not really giving in. I think you get a chance to go out there. And like I said, you're overmatched. I was throwing 85 to 87 um, against professional baseball players that are, you know, five, 10 years older than me. And, and I just didn't have a chance. Um, you kind of learn some little things that you wouldn't learn until later in pro ball, uh, being able to pitch backwards in counts. Um, it was one thing that we never really did too much. It was always outside, outside, outside. Um, you know, learning that there's no real rules in pitching. Um, Chris was really, really good with that with me was understanding that, you know, I, I can strive to put every pitch that I have in every quadrant of the strike zone. You know, there's no real rules. There's no one spot that you can throw your two seam. Um, you know, there's no one spot you can throw your change up and kind of figuring that out at a younger age. than I think a lot of kids do is, was really, really huge for me. And that way, when my stuff kind of came along and physicality became a, a better part of my game, uh, things kind of just kept taking off. Yeah, you mentioned the name Greg Hamilton, Mike. Um, I've been fortunate enough to interview a few guys uh, that have played for him. Um, obviously, to have the foresight to let you work through uh, progressions at that young age, again, not really lighten up the radar gun, uh, learning how to pitch. Speak to the legendary coach Greg Hamilton, uh, certainly his willingness to stand by you and give you the opportunity to grow in that program. Uh, at a time when maybe you weren't quite ready, but clearly it worked out very, very well in the end. Yeah, I think most of that first election is probably better credited to uh, Chris Rietzma. I think he probably was in there a little more making sure that I was on that trip. But, um, you know, I, I still remember that first game with Team Canada. I think it gave up, you know, five or six runs over two innings uh, against the Braves, actually. And uh, I still remember him, you know, being there and being the stern force to kind of be able to tell me, you know, keep going, keep throwing strikes, keep going. And, and he understands that when he brings kids on trips like that, he understands they're going to kind of get their brains beaten in a little bit. And it's, it's a humbling experience. But, you know, that's kind of what set me up to kind of go in the off season and take, I don't know how many steps forward that off season to kind of just be completely somebody else. You know, I, I went, uh, like I said, 85 to 87, and we're kind of closer to 90 the next spring, but better breaking ball, a little bigger, a little stronger. Um, you know, it always gave me kind of a goal to, to be with guys that were better than me at that time and, and play against guys that were way better. Um, so Greg, Greg really has, you know, so much figured out and what he does for uh, every level of this game in, in baseball Canada is it's unbelievable. Um, you know, I know a lot of people say it, but I don't know exactly what baseball Canada would be without him. Um, you know, he's, he's incredible and he's another part of the reason why everybody's so proud to, to wear the Canadian Jersey. Yeah. It seems to me, uh, as long as I can remember baseball in this country, I remember the name Greg Hamilton. It appears he's been with that team uh, forever, <laughs> as long as it's been around. So uh, clearly he's doing something right. He's uh, created really um, a legendary status with the program. And in every single year it continues to grow and grow and grow. So um, obviously the team Canada experience led to a recruiting process. And uh, one of the things we do here on our program is uh, help young kids get noticed down South. Although you didn't end up going, Mike, I'm curious about the process of being recruited by a power five school. Uh, just talk about what that's like starting to get those phone calls uh, where big time coaches from places like Cal Berkeley are starting to reach out to Mike Soroka. Yeah. I, I, for starters, it was uh, kind of some coaches just through hearsay. Um, you know, Brandon Newell actually put me in touch with uh, the head coach at uh, Oregon State, which at the time they were the number one school uh, for baseball. And it was kind of just like, whoa, um, that was one of the first schools you talked to. And, uh, they came up, 
Pat Bailey, actually their assistant coach, actually came up to watch me throw a bullpen. And, uh, it was more of the same thing. They were kind of just banking on me keep to, to keep taking steps forward. Um, and you know, it, it's kind of overwhelming at first, especially when you start to kind of get your name out there. I uh, went to a couple of showcases, but not too, too many that were uh, you know, overly uh, pushed out. I mean, I was on the backfield there in uh, Jupiter at the big perfect game at the end of the year. And um, you start to get all the recruitment letters, but it's really kind of tough to decipher who wants you just there to, to be a part of their, um, they basically put on little camps and clinics that they bring kids into and see if there's anything that they want you to add, or they actually think you could be a part of their program. Um, that's a little tough at first. And uh, it's a little, also a little tough to, to kind of judge who really thinks what. So uh, really it, was a, it wasn't until the next year and Velocity jumped again, uh, going into, I guess, the fall. Um, and I had a few other schools reach out, one of them, Cal Berkeley. Uh, Arizona State um, ended up going to Indiana, which is uh, where Matt Lloyd went. And, um, you know, I actually really loved it there in Bloomington. But uh, the coaches and the, the opportunity at Cal Berkeley was, was just too good for me. It was too good of a match. And, um, you know, I knew. I knew when it happened. I think that's where most kids – kind of struggle is they're like, okay, well, I have so many schools to choose from, no matter what level it may be. You know, I, I would just say, do your visits, go, go do your homework, do your homework on the coach, ask the guys on the team, um, you know, how they actually like playing there. Cause most of them are going to be pretty honest. Um, you know, that's something that I made sure to do. And, and Cal was kind of just the place that was most resoundingly, you know, this is the place for me and felt at home and, um, even though it's nothing like Calgary, um, it is, it is what it is, but, uh, that was my decision and i uh, still in contact with those coaches today. That's interesting. Up until June of 15, did you, uh, were you still in the mindset that that was on the horizon, that the college career was next for you? And, uh, what was the determining factor, obviously getting chosen in the first round, uh, and the money that goes along with it, uh, was a huge factor, but was there something else that played in that said, you know what, I'm going to pass on college and, uh, and go the pro route. Yeah. Again, going back to the junior days, you get to see the professional baseball players and you get to see who you're, who you're competing against when you step over to the other side. Uh, for me going into that off season before the draft. Uh, again, it was kind of just physicality. It was like, you know, I know I belong in college. I know I'll be in the weekend rotation somewhere in college, but you cross over to pro ball, it's kind of a, another beast. And I don't think a lot of people quite realize that. Um, so for me, that, that off season, I, I got together with my trainer at the time was Chris Osmond, who's uh, now the head strength coach for uh, the Flyers, actually. Um, and I said, Chris, I need to throw harder. I need to throw harder. I need to get bigger, stronger, faster. Um, we had five months to do it. So I, I came out another like four or five miles an hour up that spring. And uh, I kind of took off. But once I kind of had that fastball to, to carry me a little bit better, um, that's when things were kind of starting to switch. And I said, you know what? I think this opportunity to go professionally is probably the, the better one to, to get me to the big leagues because it's ultimately the goal. Um, you know, for a long time, you dream of playing in college and, um, you know, the college atmosphere is something that I, I wish I kind of got more of, um, and I didn't get to kind of be a part of, but, um, you get into professional baseball and if you're not physically ready for that, um, you know, it's going to be pretty tough to move forward, but I knew signing, signing that contract gave me a better chance to be in the big league sooner. And, um, it did, it, it paid off for me. Yeah, the Golden Bears loss was uh, clearly the Braves' gain. Um, clearly everything changed in June of 2015 when your name was called uh, before any Canadian in history. Uh, give us a rundown of the day, uh, how you heard, what you were doing, and uh, just the euphoric, obviously, uh, feeling that you had knowing that your dreams were coming true and you were heading off to the bigs. Yeah, I think it was actually... Uh, um might have been highest Albertan in history. I think that's, that might be what it, what it was. Because I know there's quite a few Canadians that have been – actually, Josh Naylor, same year as I was, he, he went pick 14. Oh, geez. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, I think Albertan. But, yeah, um, you know, that day, pretty stressful. Um, 
you know, you know, it's going to kind of de determine the next few years of your life. And um, I knew there was a couple of us from the Canadian class, a couple of my buddies that were supposed to kind of go in that kind of first day. And obviously, Josh Naylor was one of them. But um, the draft, I guess, watching it, we didn't have too many people over at the time that was suggested um, by my advisor, now agent, uh, and Ritzma as well was kind of just, you know, unless, unless we know exactly where you're going, keep it light, keep it, keep it small, keep the circle tight until it actually happens and then have people over because you don't want to be sitting there watching the TV, waiting for your name to get called with, you know, a bunch of your family and friends there and, and to kind of just have to wear it uh, as you don't get called. So um, as the day went on, uh, didn't really get real. And for me until Josh got picked, it picked, I was like 13 or 14. Um, I think Allard was actually picked at 14, so right behind him. And uh, that's when things kind of started to ramp up a little bit for me with the nerves. And, uh, you know, I guess the toughest part is because it's out of your hands. At least when you're on the mound, you got the ball in your hands, you're in control. Uh, but after that, it was, you know, I did everything I could. And it's up to uh, some other people's opinions now. And uh, very thankful that the uh, Atlanta Braves saw something that was uh, worth taking in the first round. Yeah, such a difference in, in baseball, Mike, with the immediate impact of first round picks as compared to other sports. Uh, talk about the thought process of, A, going from the euphoria of being drafted in the first round and then realizing that there's a long road ahead because, again, in basketball and football, you get drafted in the first round, you're expected to make an immediate impact right in the majors, uh, the top level teams. Baseball, it's different. You know you have years ahead of minor league ball. So talk about how you switch quick from euphoria to now the grind is on and i got to find my way uh, for the next few years to get progressing through the minor leagues. Yeah, I think it changes pretty quick when you get down to the Gulf Coast League and um, you're basically all alone at that point, you know, and it's kind of what Greg really tried to prepare us for was really having to take the onus on yourself to to improve and, and be a better ball player. Obviously, as a first rounder, as a 17 year old, you're going to have the team looking out for you, making sure that you know, you're not taking any bad steps. But really, for the most part, to kind of go out there and compete and, and take what you want, uh, you know, that, that's up to you. And I think I actually probably came in maybe a little too much like that. Um, you know, I, I might have, I think I might have told our assistant. Uh, farm director that I didn't belong in the Gulf Coast League, like my second game there. Um, you know, and the whole time, I, I think actually that at that time was um, the high A team had a bus crash um, in North Carolina. And there was a bunch of them down there rehabbing a bunch of bad backs, and, um, bruised shoulders and stuff like that. But um, I'd watched a couple of them pitch one of them, Lucas Sims, um, and a few other ones. And, you know, you can see some separators, they were more or less much tighter around the strike zone. And uh, they were able to command a couple of pitches for strikes. And I can remember telling people, I was like, I can do that. Why am I not in high A? You know, let's, let's go. And, um, you know, really kind of figuring it out, I guess, after my first full season that, you know, I need to kind of relax a little bit uh, or figure out how to relax was, was kind of big. And I actually had a lot more fun my second full season in, in double A. Um, you know, it's probably one of the more fun seasons I've ever had playing baseball. I'm interested as, as a young pitcher, Mike, what are the, uh, the focal points of, of getting into that first camp? And is it, is it velo? Or are you trying to light up the gun or is it, uh, is it pitching overthrowing? Is it fastball command? Uh, what are you trying to impact immediately when you first get down there and start to try to open some eyes, to hopefully make a big league roster in the future? Yeah, for me, honestly, it's aggressiveness. Um, you know, good things happen when you're pitching on the offense and, um, you know, you're going to get beat sometimes, but more often than not, that's what kind of puts the extra little life on your ball, right? Um, you know, everybody talks about late life. Everybody talks about, you know, so this guy just has something different on it. And I think for the most part, that's aggression. Um, you see that from the best in Max Scherzer, Clayton Kershaw. You know, their intent is, is always at 100%, although they're staying within, you know, what what they're physically capable of. They're not overthrowing, but, you know, they're pushing their limits. Um, so I think for me, it was just about getting into pro ball and, and really 
just letting it fly. Um, you know, going to have fun, going to get strikeouts, going to going to kind of show off that you know I did have three pitches out of high school and was able to kind of use all of them and and you know that's that's all it was for me. And once you kind of settle in a little bit, there's some things to learn. And one of them is obviously fastball command, not just side to side anymore, but up down side to side, uh, and combination of both. And, uh, being able to actually throw balls on purpose um, when you need to is is kind of what separates a lot of people in the minor leagues is being able to pitch inside, you know, keep it between basically the edge of the plate and the white line. Um, that's a pitch, obviously, with me with the singer that really opened a lot up for me once I was able to kind of start pitching in on righties. and um, You know, it, it really made things a lot better for me, but Again, that was double A. I did most of my, my pitching learning in double A. And uh, that's also credit to, to our pitching coach there is uh, Derek Lewis. And he was a lot of fun. Yeah, I was going to ask the last question about sort of the early time in your career. Is there somebody that immediately stands out in your mind uh, that sort of took you on your wing uh, down there and maybe had a bigger impact than some of the other guys? Uh, someone, again, that's set, set you on the right path in your minor league career anyway. Um, are we talking like players, coaches, yeah, anybody, anyone that stands out, someone that again, took you under their wing and really had an impact on you. Yeah. I think there was a couple of guys, uh, in specific in my draft class that really, uh, were good competitors and good people. Um, you know, I think that's probably what a lot of kids miss is, is somebody that, um, can kind of show them how to be a good person as well. And, and, you know, cause it's not always easy. You're always competing against each other, but it's a lot easier when you're all friends and you all actually like each other. And uh, two of those guys for me were Matt Withrow and um, um, Patrick Weigel and uh, Josh Graham as well. Um, you know, I got to kind of become good friends with them, even though they were a few years older than me um, and really kind of understand that they're a little more relaxed. They're a little more, they've seen a little more, uh, been in college, dealt with a couple injuries Um you know, it was little things like that that, that you get to kind of lean on going up and, and it doesn't make you feel like a teenager anymore when you're hanging out with those guys. It, you kind of grow up a little quicker and, and learn how to be uh, a little more mature in the game. Yeah, no question. And on to the Braves. Obviously, that's uh, what the listeners want to hear about. Uh, I'm super curious about lots of things regarding this team. Uh, again, we spoke off air a little bit about it. Um, over the last couple of years, we've seen the arrival of some of the most talented athletes in the entire league. Uh, was there a point as you were making your way through the organization that you, you recognized the truly special group of young talent that was around you and what really could turn out to be an incredible team going forward? Um. You know, I was always spoiled because I, I hit every level with uh, Acuna um, and mostly Riley, too. And there was kind of a gap here and there with us. But, um, you know, we were spoiled in, in what we saw every single day was just professional baseball. Um, you know, when you get to be in a rotation in low A that consists of myself, Max Freed, Tuki Toussaint, Colby Allard, Patrick Weigel, um, all big leaguers, you know, Ricardo Sanchez as well. He's another big leaguer. So really six of us um, in that rotation, we were all young. We all had good stuff. Um, we saw it every single day. And at the plate, there wasn't too many times where I was overly wowed. Um, but that that time that I, I really was, was actually uh, in Mississippi with Acuna. And Allard and I had had an argument whether Acuna's best season in the big leagues, whether he hits 30 home runs or not. Hmm. And at the time, like I said, he was still, I don't know if he's a 19, I think he was. Um, and I think Allard said, no, I said, yes. Um, which obviously we now know 30 was low, um, <laughs> but he hit a change up. It was, a, it was like a full count or a three, one change up that he kind of stopped on. Like you can tell when a hitter, see something and they hold up, they hold their hands back and then they let it go. Mm -hmm. He hit a change of over the batter's eye in Mississippi at night, which is like, it's, 
it's probably one of the most pitcher friendly parks in the United States. And, um, you know, he's clearing the batter's eye on it. That was kind of one of those ones. I remember I was in the stands and I looked down to Allard in the dugout and he's looking at me and he's just kind of like, yeah, you know, I see that now, you know, I, I get it. And, um, to see him and how he's progressed uh, has been kind of the most special part of it. Um, but like you said, the, the whole league, um, you know, what Toronto's got with, um, Vlad Jr. and, and Bichette and Biggio, um, that's pretty special. I, I think a lot of people were waiting for Guerrero to kind of figure it out a little bit at the big league level. Um, I always thought he would. Um, I've seen him too many times figure it out to, to not know that he was going to do it in the big leagues, and to see him doing it now is no surprise. And uh, all over the league, like you said, the Tatis and Soto, um, there's going to be a pretty good era of baseball players for a long time. I think that's really exciting to be a part of. Yeah, I think the thing that strikes me most, Mike, is the uh, the unbelievable personalities around the league of this young core group. Um, they're just having a blast playing the game. The chemistry in your organization, again, stands out to me as, as phenomenal uh, compared to some of the kind of more uh, traditional organizations like the Yankees, like the Red Sox. Um, Talk about the impact of uh, Brian Snicker and how he allows you guys to truly um, exude happiness, uh, to do your thing out there. Again, the Acuna, Albies, Freeman, um, guys truly having a blast playing the game and how that differs from, again, some of the more uh, low-key organizations that do it kind of the old-school way. Yeah, I think the Braves were that old-school way for a long time. Uh, and it really wasn't until probably about 2017 that things kind of started to switch. And um, I mean, the great part about Smith is, is he was in the minor leagues for so many years. He's in his 40 some year of baseball. Ron Washington is in his, like 52nd year of baseball. Um, and they both love this game with everything they have, and they want us to love it too. Um, you know, it, it helps as well when uh, you kind of come up as a big part of the rebuild and you get to be with a, a guy like Freddie or, or even Julio Tehran who went through the rebuild in the big leagues, you know, had those tough seasons and kind of saw the light at the end and got through it. Um, that's pretty cool to be a part of. And especially when you're doing it with some of your friends that were all the way up and um, you know, the, this game is just a little bit different now in, in the way that the veterans are kind of coaxing the younger guys to want to feel comfortable and play. Obviously they're keeping them in the lines in some respects. I'm sure there's, there's more than a few where you kind of got to say, Hey, you know, that's, that's a no go or some things that you uh, make a blunder on. And um, you know, they're there to help you through that and learn what it means to be a big leaguer as opposed to punish you and make you walk on eggshells. And um, you know, when you talk about things like hazing and stuff like that, I still think there's cool things that, you guys can do as rookies. You always have the bullpen bag. Somebody's got to have the, um, you know, my little pony backpack going out to the bullpen or uh, the rookies go get coffee. Um, I think those are all really good things for team building, but obviously the, the stuff that's a little more um, damaging, I guess, to, to a confidence would be uh, the stuff that this game's kind of eradicated. And, um, you know, we understand that when you get a guy like Ronald Acuna get called up, you want him to feel comfortable because you want him playing at his best. You don't want to feel you don't want him to feel like he can't go out there and be himself um, because I mean, he saw what he did for the first two or three weeks of this season basically carried the team. Uh, I think everybody would probably agree that we were the Atlanta Acunas for a while. Um, and I mean, he was he was it. So when you have a guy like that come up, you know, why, why not let him be himself and, and show what he's capable of? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's easier to allow uh, a young player to obviously um, demonstrate uh, the way that he does if he plays the game the right way. And and certainly he, uh, he absolutely does. I, I want to touch on something that happened earlier this year that I, I, I watched it and it, it happened and I was incredulous as I've ever been watching this beautiful game. And uh, the routine grounder to Didi Gregorius, mm. uh, he did not weight on the baseball he did not dog it he threw a seed uh over to one and there's acuna beating it out and and that to me was one of the greatest plays i've ever witnessed on the baseball field uh, just talk about 
you know, again, you guys must have chatted about it afterwards. And uh, just, again, that day-to-day go-get-it of Ronald Acuna and what that means to the, the leadership of this team going forward. Yeah, that that's everything. I mean, when you see him out there and he has a smile on his face, and obviously it's easy to come to play when, when you're seeing the ball good and everything's going right. But, um, you know, that that's one of the special things that he can do um, when he's feeling good, when he's fully healthy, and he can let it fly every end. Um, if he got out there and, and he beat out that ground ball, um, I don't think a lot of people quite understand what that takes to finish a swing, get out of the box. And nevertheless, like a lot of people, what they wouldn't even kind of really recognize was that he took two steps after he hit first base. He was running like 31 feet per second and took two steps to slow down after he hit first. And I don't think people quite understand the freak nature that takes to really slow it down like that. And, and um, like, I, like I said, he's, he's an incredible athlete and um, to see him really go out there and give an effort. And uh, he always wanted to make the plays um, in the minor leagues all the way up. He was out there to show out and very similarly to how I kind of mentioned coming into pro ball, you just want to be aggressive and kind of show off a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with that. I remember for a backfield game at the very end of spring training, um, I guess 2017, I would think the year I went to double A and, um, he was running straight, straight backwards. So balls hit the center field. He turns around and he's running out to the outfield. It's raining and he's making a catch like this over his head, dove straight for it. And everybody is like, <laughs> you know, like, what, that's a top 10 play for the next year if we get that on video but this kid just made it in a backfield game and nobody will ever know um you know it's little things like that that when you see him having fun and he's running ground balls out hard he's taking every bag that the other team might give him um and he's throwing runners out Uh, it's much watch base it's must much must watch baseball every day yeah no no question uh one thing to see the spectacular but uh, in my mind to turn the mundane of a routine ground ball directly at the shortstop into an electric play is uh it's mind-boggling it, it certainly is something i've never seen uh and again i talk about it all the time when i coach my kids that uh did you do you remember seeing acuna uh on that routine grounder because man that's that is special special talent and ability and uh want to uh for sure on the flip side uh, it appears the leader of your team is uh, a polar opposite of uh, Acuna. Uh, that being, of course, Freddie Freeman, the de- defending MVP of the National League. He uh, appears to me to be about the most easygoing guy uh, that may be in the league. Um, speak to Freddie and uh, sort of what he brings to the group uh, on a different level than what Acuna and Albies may do. Yeah, I think especially in the last, I, I'll, I'll even say the last three or four years that I've been up to see Freddie work every day and kind of what he's become and, and what it means to be a true professional. Um, he has fun in his own way, but like I said, not, not everybody can compete while, you know, being all over the place, smiling and everybody talking to everybody. And, uh, you know, Freddie, when he's out in the field is, is pretty loose. Um, you know, I can hear him over at first base sometimes and, uh, it just doesn't kind of come off that way, but he's what you think of when you think of a hitter that is locked in on every single pitch, you know, he's going to have his ups and downs just like every, every major leaguer. But when you think about the great hitters that are up there to hunt every single pitch, um, he's one of them that comes in mind. You're going to see that stance forever. Um, you know, you're going to see him get in there and, and looks like he's ready to do damage. And Donaldson was the same way. Bautista in his days, same way, was always just this guy is going to do damage on this pitch and you feel it coming and when it happens, you're not surprised. Mm. Um, You know, it looks planned, but 
Yeah, Freddie, uh, he, he often reminds me of John Olerud an awful lot as a guy who, again, his bat stays in the zone longer than anyone I can remember uh, on great plane always and seems to find a way to put bat on ball, uh, certainly in the barrel area, an awful lot of time. Uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, that he's loose on the field. I do remember a great mic'd up moment with Freddie. Uh, I'm sure it's been uh, all over social media and people have watched it. And uh, he seems to be actually a pretty funny guy when uh, deep down and, and certainly does keep it loose out on the field. So that's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, 2019, Mike, was a, a very, very special season in so many ways um, for you not only for the team again, but for individually as well. Uh, take us through um, what must have been an unbelievable moment when you heard the All-Star selection, uh, where you were and how you how you learned something like that at the big league level and knowing that you were heading off to the uh, the biggest game of the season. Yeah, we were in New York actually. And uh, it's kind of ironic because it seems like everything big for me happens in New York with my call up, um, opening day start, got the news that I go to the all-star game and, um, you know, Snit kind of was able to hold the clubhouse together and, and hand out the, the pamphlets basically that you get given from MLB when you're invited, um, you know, got, uh, Freddie and Acuna there first. And, you know, honestly that year, I thought there was two or three other guys that could have very well been there and, um, he'd won last and, um, I thought there was a chance, but I also came up later in the season um, where I was like three weeks in. I, I still wasn't quite qualified, I don't think. I was very close um, in a lot of like the ERA numbers, races and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, when he says your name, it's kind of surreal because, again, just that previous year, you're a rookie. I only threw five games before I got hurt and headed down to Orlando. Um, got you know, small setback in spring training that year that delayed me until, until that time. And at that time, there was more than a few of us that had pitched so well uh, to kind of earn a spot in the big leagues. And um, I kind of got to get out there and, and really not know if my next start was a given. Um, when I came up in 2018, it was, you know, you're going to go out there, you're going to make your starts, you're going to learn. And 2019 was time to win. You know, if, if you don't, uh, go out there with your stuff, you know, they're probably going to find a replacement. So um, really kind of just going start to start for the first at least 10 or 15 uh, and kind of look back at what I had done over that little stretch uh, was pretty cool. And, and that's definitely the, the most surreal moment of my career was joining the all-star team and kind of getting in there with the, with the clubhouse and uh, really feeling like, whoa, do I, do I actually belong here? Um, you know, I think going forward after that, that's something that sticks with you that, you know, you want to make sure that you get out there and you're able to perform at your best again to know that it wasn't a fluke. You know, you want to be out there, you want to prove it to yourself, you want to prove it to everybody else. And, um, you know, you want to, you want to be there again for the people that um, gave you the opportunity to be there in the first place. And, um, you know, that, that was, that was something that I'll always remember, you know, I'll have memorabilia in my house from that one forever as well. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, talk about it, Mike, just uh, the arrival at Progressive Field, uh, walking into the clubhouse, as you mentioned, probably surrounded by uh, everyone you could possibly admire in the game, all in one place at one time. Uh, the whole two-day experience, just speak to the all-star thing. I know it's different in Major League Baseball than all other games. Um, yeah, just give us a, a just a short idea of what that two days is like for you. Uh I mean, it's crazy. I mean, uh, you get to kind of see some guys around the hotel. Um, the funny part is that obviously I was a first timer and a rookie. I was probably fairly unrecognizable to most of them. Um, you know, if they saw me at a hotel, they probably would have thought I was some kid looking for autographs or something. And, um, you know, to kind of, kind of be there with them. And, um, you know, you see Clayton Kershaw on the elevator and stuff like that. And, um, that's, that's quite surreal to, to really be a part of that. And, um, I'm lucky. I also got to do it with Freddie and Ronald. Um, cause Ronald obviously had his entourage there and he was having fun and, uh, Freddie had all of his family and we got to, you know, my family got to spend time with his and, um, you know, that, that was, that was a pretty cool time for, I think, uh, my dad and my stepmom as well. And, uh, all family and friends that got to kind of watch from a distance, like, 
you know, that was the really wow moment. And, um, you know, that, that game was different because you're not used to coming out of the bullpen. You're not used to having kind of a scripted inning. And they told me, I think I had sort of the fifth of the sixth inning. Um, and I said, okay, I got to watch Kershaw warm up and Bueller. Um, I warming up, honestly, Mark Fryer was there. He was the, the bullpen coach, obviously for the Dodgers. And, um, I had one of the worst pregame bullpens ever. It was just like, it was all over the place. I don't know if it's because I just, you know, didn't know what I was doing. I was paying attention to too much else. And, uh, it was, it was terrible. Um, yeah, I'm sure he was thinking like, you know, this could be bad. You know, I wasn't, ball just wasn't coming out great. Wasn't putting the ball where I wanted. Change up was spiked. Sliders were backing up. It was just, it was terrible. And I actually kind of almost took it out to the game too and was feeling for it still when I went out there. And after a while, I was like, all right, I just got to, I just got to rip it. And uh, ran into a couple of easier outs with, uh, I think a couple of 3 1, 3 0 pop out. Um, so I got out of that. And, um, again, I think everybody envisions their outing going like how Beaver's outing went or DeGrom's in 2000 and whatever it was, 16, with the immaculate inning. Uh, everybody wants that to happen, but, uh, I was out here battling, uh, down on the count three, one. So that's what it is. Yeah. No question. Do you remember who you faced, Mike? It was a scoreless sixth, uh, just to make sure we're on that. Um, do you remember which three guys you faced in that inning? It was Merrifield, Vogelbach, um, and uh, Carlos Santana. And Santana was actually interesting because I faced him in a backfield game when he was rehabbing. Hmm. And he seemed to be able to pull. I threw a sinker on the, almost in the other batter's box. And he was reaching out way over the plate to yank it and hit basically a line drive at the second baseman. Um, it was a two-seam in the other batter's box. And I was like, you know, that was a, that was a weird one, but... Um, him and then got two, like three one or three zero pop outs from Vogelbach and uh, Whit Merrifield. You uh, you finish a scoreless inning in the in the All Star game. What's the feeling at that point? Are you are you just flat out relieved that it's over? Uh, that you didn't didn't uh, screw up as you mentioned going in there with maybe not your best stuff, uh, but then you walk to the dugout and be able to just sit back and enjoy the last three innings of the ball game. Yeah, I think. Yeah you're out there and, and it's a little different because all of a sudden phones are allowed in the dugout. And a lot of guys have, have other people hanging around and, and obviously pre COVID too. So now thinking back on that, it's almost weird to think about, but um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. Just kind of shake Dave Roberts hand, shake Brian Snickers hand, um, you know, see a bunch of guys that again, you play against every day. It's, it's a different atmosphere. Um you know, it really was kind of cool to sit in there in, in the dugout. And I think Woodruff and Alcantara came in after me and they were throwing quite a bit harder. I think they were throwing like 99 or 100 that day. So, um, you know, it's kind of cool to, to watch those guys and, um, you know, very, very thankful for that experience. Yeah, I've always been curious about uh, the desire to win at the All-Star Game as uh, we hear, oh, yeah, they're professionals, they want to win. Is there is there an intensity there in the All-Star Game that they actually do want to come out on top, or is everybody really just there for the exhibition of it all? Um, I think it's mostly for the exhibition and the fun. I mean, it's so hard when, I mean, your weight room is turned into the Fox News room, basically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that gets taken away. A lot of things that that you typically wouldn't do and typically before a game where i'm pitching i'd be pretty well locked away on my own and i'm not a totally locked in person on game day i like to kind of keep it loose and have fun but i keep to myself and um you know I, here i am sitting in the training room there was like 25 people in the training room telling stories and i'm sitting in here for like two hours listening to them because they're all avoiding the media in the locker room hmm. um but um uh, you know, it's little things like that that I think you go there for. And um, obviously, once the game starts, everybody's trying to show out again. Um, if it happens, it happens. And you're going to pull the right strings if it's later in the game and you're winning because you, you got literally an all-star bullpen and um, you get to see the best of the best. Yeah, second half of the season, Mike, obviously things start to really, really come together for this group. 
um, October of 2019. What has to be the highlight of your career so far? Uh, when did you know you were getting the ball for pivotal game three uh, against the Cards at uh, historic Bush Stadium? And man, what was that like to just know, who this is on me now? Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know exactly when I found out, but once they set the rotation, that's pretty well what we thought about. Um, you know, obviously that one was a very asked question after that series, but, um, you know, I don't think a lot of people quite understand that when I went out there in game three, I got to watch two playoff games for the first time in my life. Whereas, you know, had I started one of those, it would have been a completely new experience. And, you know, there's some things going on with the, the packed house, the flyover, everything's going on, but I got to watch Dallas Keiko go out there and, and execute and not give in and realize too, that the game's a little different in the playoffs when as a starter, you know, in a regular season, you're really trying to kind of be efficient and, um, you know, kind of push innings through and, and understand that, you know, sometimes you're going to give up a couple, but you got to go out next inning and, you know, at bats change, uh, if I'm saying that kind of right, is that, you know, you're going to come after a hitter in the regular season a lot more because, you know, you're okay if they beat you. It's like, whatever, you know, I got to move on. I, I can't throw seven pitches to every batter or else, you know, I'm going to be out of here in the fourth inning and then I'm going to hurt my bullpen. But in the playoffs, it's a little different. You can't quite give in like that. You know, you, you really got to be strong on some of the middle bats in the order. You, you don't want to get beat by them. Um, you know, you got to be strong with two strikes and, make sure that you do finish the guys that you need to finish. And um, I got to watch that. So I got to watch Dallas do that. And I got to watch Mike fulton do that uh, in game two, which is honestly probably one of the best games of his career. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to kind of follow their lead into game three, it was so big for me to, to take that and to just let it fly. Um, it's a different atmosphere because you know that one of these games could be your last and, you know, you want to go as deep as possible. And I get to, to throw to Brian McCann, who's been there so many times before, and, and see how he was handling things and how he was happy to happy to be there. You know, everybody has a smile on their face. Everybody's not all locked down and nervous. Um, you know, that helps so much to be able to just go out there and, and, and play. I think, you know, from pitch one, I was locked in, you know, made a, made a game of it. Yeah, for all intents and purposes, Mike, you had a uh, a truly dominant outing. There's no really other way to put it. You go seven complete uh, with just two hits, seven Ks. Uh, you're clearly rolling along, but you left the game trailing. Um, I remember truly that game like it was yesterday. Uh, but try to give us just the slightest idea of the roller coaster of emotions as you get into the ninth. Donaldson leads off with a rope double down the line. Uh, and then Kmart or uh, Cmart, sorry, blows away two guys. So now you're down to your final out. Uh, just talk about uh, when Dansby hits that off the wall and Duvall follows it up. Just, you know, what's going on in that dugout? I mean, it was obviously euphoria, but give us an idea of sort of where you were with two down in the ninth, and uh, and again how it just changed so dramatically in that unbelievable ninth inning. Yeah, I think you get in there and and you're living and dying by each out really uh, at that point, especially in the seventh, eighth inning, one run ball game. Um, you know, you're, you're so close and um, uh, to, to be a part of that in the dugout and as a starter, usually you get out in the sixth, seventh inning and um, you'll stay and watch a little bit, but then you got to kind of go and do some work to make sure you're ready for the next time. But spending that whole rest of the game in the dugout, not going to change, not going to get in the shower quick, um, you get to kind of be a part of it and see how much more lively it is. And so pay, playoff baseball is just a different beast. Um, everybody kind of says that. I mean, it's, it's playoffs everywhere, but I feel like baseball is a little different because there's fewer games. Um, you know, typically matchups are a lot closer at that point, um, you know, because there's fewer teams in the playoffs. Um, it, it really is kind of a cool experience. And um, after you do that, that's when you understand what it's like to have the chance to be on a team that gets there every single year. Um, and that's something that I hope to be a part of for a long time. Yeah. Amazing. You mentioned that as a member of the Atlanta Braves who had the longest run in major league history of consecutive division titles uh, back in the days of 
of three pretty good pitchers, Maddox Clavin and Smoltz, of course. Um, for my money, as a fan of the game of baseball, not necessarily the two teams involved, that was one of the highlights of my entire life, watching that ball game. It was, uh, again, cheering for you as a Canadian, uh, cheering for the comeback uh, that was just beyond all belief. And with the close ties to Josh Donaldson uh, as a friend of uh, the, the, the Blue Jays previously, uh, it was just epic, epic in every way, and certainly something I'm sure you'll never forget, uh, as well as the rest of Canada watching that unbelievable ball game. Uh, obviously, that season ended not the way you guys wanted to. Um, won't get into that final game because uh, I'm sure it's been spoken of way too much in your mind. But clearly, you guys going into that off season pretty excited uh, about the prospects going forward in 2020. Then uh, the COVID, uh, the Rona comes and sort of puts a whole damper on everything on this globe, especially uh, 2020 season for you guys. Speak to the disappointment um, and what you guys were thinking as a group as you uh, embarked on what you didn't really know uh, as far as 2020 season was going to be. Yeah, I think a lot of us at a certain point in spring training were, you know, they said, okay, two weeks, and then they pushed back and said, no, just go home. Um you know, a lot of us were wondering in summer camp whether the season was actually going to get off or not. Um, we all had our doubts whether it was actually able to. You know, if it only took one or two positive tests to shut things down for the league, uh, it was going to be really, really hard. But uh, thankfully, we have a game that's a little more distanced than most. And you know, our clubhouses are, are meant to kind of accommodate that. We don't have as many people around on a daily basis. But, um, you know, it, it was so tough, I think especially right at the start because we just didn't know if it was going to happen. Summer camp started. It was weird playing against each other in an inner squad for, um, you know, three weeks. But I think once the season started, we were able to kind of make a, a transition to say, all right, well, you know, we're here. Whether people want to acknowledge this as a real season or not, we may as well win it. Um, you know, it's not going to change what we do going into 21. We're still going to go and try and win it. Um, so that, that was kind of the mentality that switched for us. And, um, I obviously wish I could have been there in the playoffs and, um, that was pretty tough to watch that, but, uh, all fuel for the fire going forward. Yeah, no question. It, uh, you were given a truly great honor, Mike, as the youngest, um, youngest in history of the Braves, which is remarkable to say the least, considering again, the names of Maddox, Glavin, Smoltz, among others, uh, as the youngest to ever take the bump on opening day, uh, again, give us an idea of when you found that out uh the honor that goes along with that and then uh again how it drastically turned south for you <laughs> um certainly after the injury and everything uh, again just let us know what you were thinking when you were told opening day was yours yeah obviously a cool moment and something that uh i don't want to say was expected because you don't expect things like that but those are little goals that you you kind of set forth as when you watch uh, opening day in, in the past and you watch a lot of the best tee off against each other. You want to, you want to be a part of that one day. And obviously given that the year I had and um, you know, how everything was going in spring training, I, I think we were about this close to being able to kind of give me that, um, that nod in spring training, uh, but we got shut down and sent home. So uh, it was probably, about a week or two into, into summer camp where Brian kind of came down the hall and, and saw me and let me know that that, uh, that honor was going to be bestowed upon me. And, um, you know, it's kind of going to be an experience. It was nice to kind of hear what he had to say and, you know, said that, uh, I want you on the mound. I want you to kind of set the tone and, uh, here we go. So I got to tee off against DeGrom and watch him throw sliders harder than some of my fastballs. <laughs> Um, you know, I got to do that and that was, that was a good time. Yeah. He's, uh, he's pretty electric to say the very least. Um, give us an idea of, uh, the outsiders that don't get a chance or didn't get a chance. Cause now we're back in the stands. Uh, what was it like playing in front of empty stadiums? Uh, again, it, it had to be surreal in so many different ways as, uh, somebody who again has to lock out the noise normally all of a sudden having zero noise and how much different that must've been. Yeah, I didn't like it. Um, I thought it was really, really weird. Um, just didn't feel like the big leagues, you know, and, and quickly you, you realize that what makes it the big leagues isn't necessarily, you know, the ease of travel, the food, 
um, the hotels, you know, whatever. It's the people that come to watch you every day. And um, you realize pretty quickly how much more important that is when you're in an empty stadium and you're kind of having to manufacture some adrenaline. Uh, we always talk about the flow state and really what that is, is the ability to manage adrenaline um, and put it forward into, you know, what you can do at your best and not think, let it happen, let your instincts play. And, and you know, I, I just, with no fans, it was, it was really, really hard to do that. Uh, I can't imagine what it would have been like as a, as a veteran, somebody that played 10 or 15 years in the big league, having to do it with nobody. I, I think that would be really, really weird. But, um, you know, even just back in, in a spring training game, I don't even know. They had like two or 3,000 people there in Fort Myers. And, you know, even that just feels much more lively and, and it's incredible. Um, you know, I got to be in the dugout here on our opening weekend and um, that was that was pretty cool uh, to kind of see people back in. Um, the whatever the 13,000 that we let in were much, much louder than, you know, the 13,000 that we'd usually see. And, um, you know, I think they were all just happy to have us back. And uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we're 100 percent capacity um, this coming homestand. So. Um, it's going to be pretty cool to, to, to see that again and, and really feel the liveliness in the ballpark. Yeah, I was just about to say that it was announced uh, yesterday that you guys are back to 100%, and thank goodness for that. It's uh, It's been a long time coming. Uh, again, they did it at Globe uh, earlier this year, and that was pretty cool. As a Jays fan, they were part of that opening day in Texas, and mm -hmm. uh, seeing the crowd and the, the just the electricity of the, the building was man sorely sorely missed and we're definitely excited uh that being said mike i know you're still a little ways away i just want to touch on really quick before we go um such an odd injury for a for a baseball player and a pitcher for sure uh to injure your achilles of all things uh when it happened did you know the severity could you tell right away hey man this is this is pretty serious and i'm more than likely going to be out for a while and speak to the just the mental toughness you've needed to get through this and, and ready to kind of embark back on throwing again. Yeah, I think um, I knew right when it happened. Um, you know, I, I think a large part was due to, to me having pretty mobile ankles. Um, I was really far over my toes uh, going down the rubber. And that's actually something we're kind of working to, I don't want to say completely change because you don't want to work the uniqueness out of something, but um, you know, working on a little bit of how I'm leaving the rubber and how to not kind of put it at, uh, I, I don't want to say at risk, but how to kind of keep grinding on it. It's basically what was happening and, um, just put it at a, at a disadvantage, disadvantageous position. Um, so when it happened, I, I, I knew when it happened, um, I didn't know what the recovery time for something like that was until I was told and, you know, hearing a, a really broad window, really, it was like, you know, you might feel pretty good at six months, might take 18. Um, you know, Kevin Durant was closer to 18. And really, when you think about it, the big injury for pitchers is 18, 14 to 18 anyways, Tommy John. Uh, so when I heard, you know, six to eight, it's probably the more likely side of things just to, to get you back going, at least joining baseball activity. And obviously a game in spring training there at right around eight months. But, um, you know, it, it's difficult. Um, I think it still still feels different to me to, to think about, you know, I actually blew an Achilles and mm. it's just something you don't, like you said, ever think of happening. You know, you're prepared for arm and, you know, low back or hips or something like that that you use a lot of, but um, yeah, it, difficult. I think honestly, the most difficult part is probably right now uh, is kind of getting over that hump, learning how to do things properly again. Um, you know, not just getting out there and, and putting forth on effort. It's about being able to, to be at your best again. And, um, you know, this is where it takes that last grind to get through. And um, I'll be really excited to, to rejoin and, and be over with it. Yeah, I had a couple of great chats with uh, both Matt Lloyd and Reitz uh, regarding injury and uh, sort of the backlog of training that goes into rehabbing and the mon mundane nature of day-to-day -day activity. 
Um, both of them were very, very much in the mindset that they gained a new appreciation uh, for the game uh, having to battle through some devastating injuries. Do you feel the same, Mike, that maybe there's a little more uh, kind of admiration for what you were able to do before and all you've had to go through to get back to where you want to be? Yeah, definitely. I, I think it just puts you in a different mindset when you're out there competing every day. Um, you know, the realization that this isn't forever kind of hits you a lot earlier uh, when you get hurt. And, um, you know, it's something that, again, I didn't have to deal with until 2018. But, um, you know, there's some tough ones. And I, I think a lot of it's just being able to do it you know, pain free. That's the, that's the big one. You know, I think that's where we, again, we talk pain versus soreness. And, um, you can't be at your best when you're hurt and, um, you know, being able to get back out there and, and feel a hundred percent is not something you take for granted once you've, uh, felt what it's like to not be able to be at a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely, buddy. Well, <clears throat> I am certain that I speak for all Canadians, uh, most especially Albertans that, uh, Man, we, we we can't wait to see you back out on the bump, uh, helping the Braves uh, find their way a little bit. I got to admit, they're scuffling just a little bit. So getting you back out there, and again, some of the other guys that have uh, been injured so far, uh, just truly um, excited for that to be in the very very near future. So. Uh, Mike, it's been amazing. I, I can't possibly thank you enough for coming on the show, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule, rehabbing, uh, to spend a little time talking ball with Bex. It's been an incredible pleasure to meet you, sir. Again, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a always a pleasure, and uh, yeah, I got to do do what we can to support baseball in Canada. So thanks Cheers. for letting me be a part of that. Awesome, buddy. You take care, my friend. You too. Thank you. you. Cheers. <laughs> Well, my friends, uh, that was really something. I've got goosebumps, still on goosebumps, uh, talking some unbelievable memories with an incredible human being and a dynamite pitcher from the Atlanta Braves. That was Mike Soroka, and our thanks to him for stopping by. Man, oh man, we are stepping things up on this show. Not sure how we're going to do it, friends, but somehow we're going to try and do it even better next week. Former Blue Jay, Rob Ducey, is going to stop by and, again, talk a little ball with Beck. So thanks a lot for stopping by. Have an unbelievable week. We will see you next Sunday, 5 Eastern, 3 in the mountains, from Gap to Gap and Coast to Coast. You are talking ball with Bex.